from D. James Kennedy Ministries. This is Kennedy Classics. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Hello, I'm Frank Wright. Welcome to Kennedy Classics, a viewer-supported outreach of D. James Kennedy Ministries. I'd like to invite you to visit our website where you can avail yourself of a feast of digital, audio, video, and print resources. It's all at djkm.org. Here's a question for you. What do heroes look like? What picture comes to your mind when you think of someone courageous, determined, and willing to undergo great risk for the benefit of others. For many young people today, their first thoughts are of the mythical superheroes that populate our movie theaters and video rentals. And most of these heroes have one thing in common. They are absolutely nothing like us. They have that something extra, something special that enables them to be a hero, superior strength or intellect or ability. And like the children of Lake Wobegon, they're all above average. The women are fair of face and form, and the men are tall, handsome, and strong. That's what a hero looks like, right? Well, not so fast. Dr. Kennedy would like to introduce you to a hero, in this case, a heroine. She was a diminutive Scottish woman with a heart for God and a love for the people of Africa. Here is Dr. D. James Kennedy with his message, Mary Slessor of Calabar. May we hear God's word. The events immediately preceding this passage deal with Christ's preaching the gospel in Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, where for the most part the message was rejected. How did Christ respond to that rejection? At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And may the God who inspired the writing of these words illumine them to our hearts and minds this day. May his name ever be praised. Amen. Today, I'd like to tell you about a hero that I trust will challenge you as this hero has challenged me. And I don't care who you are, I believe you will be challenged by this life. Her name was Mary Slessor. She is known in history as Mary Slessor of Calabar. Now, today, very few people have heard of her, though a hundred years ago she was internationally famous with a fame that almost reached the heights of the fame achieved by David Livingston. She is often called the first woman missionary. Mary Slessor of Calabar. Now, I'm sure that you all remember precisely where Calabar is. As you'll know, 
It is just slightly to the west of Okoyong. Now that we've located it for you, or perhaps it'll be more helpful to say that it's under the knee of Africa. In the equatorial section of Africa on the west coast, right at the place where Africa bends and starts down. Now a part of the southern tip of what is known as Nigeria. And it was to this land that in the providence of God was called a young lassie called Mary Slessor. But that's getting ahead of the story. 1848, the same year in which Marx and Engels published their Communist Manifesto, a manifesto which was to bring millions of people into bondage, darkness, slavery, and death. But in the publishing in this world by God of one new life, many millions would ultimately be brought out of bondage and darkness into the light and life of Jesus Christ. It was a cold gray day that December 2nd, 1848, in Aberdeen, Scotland, when Mary first saw the light of day. But it was going to be in the very, very warm blue skies of the tropics that she was to achieve a worldwide fame before her death. She grew up as a bright, happy child, in spite of the difficulties of her life. She had burning blue eyes and curly red hair, and a milk-white complexion as soft as the petal of a rose. She was full of the radiance of life and she drew people to her like a magnet. Her father was very little help, though her mother was a cultured and refined Christian woman. Her father, Robert, was a drunk, and as one has written, the best thing that he ever did for Mary was to die early. In 1859, when she was 11, an event took place that was to change her life. They moved from Aberdeen to Dundee. In that same year when Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species, Mary was moving to the town where she would hear the call to go to Africa, to what Darwin considered a subspecies unworthy of concern, which would die out in the competition with the white races Mary was to have a very different view, and she was to take to them the love of Jesus Christ. Her father soon drank himself to death, and she had to go to work at the age of 11 in a weaving mill. From 6 in the morning till 6 at night, she worked amidst the shutters in the incredible din of the mill. She grew to be in her mid-teens, and she became, according to her testimony, a wild lassie. And uh, she was not interested in the things really of God at this time in her life. But there was a neighbor, a lady who was a, a widow, who was greatly concerned about the young girls in the neighborhood, and she would gather them together and tell them about Jesus Christ. But Mary wasn't particularly concerned. She con continued to live a rather rebellious life till one day she was seated in this widow's living room around the fire listening as she was teaching the Bible, unconcerned and obviously uninterested. And finally, in exasperation, this lady said to her, Mary, do you see that fire? If you were to put your hand in there, it would be very bad for you. It would burn. And unless you pay attention, and unless you repent of your sins, and unless you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are going to burn forever in hell. And those words struck terror into her heart. And she could not escape in the ensuing months the thought of eternal punishment and eternal torment. 
And finally, she fled for refuge to Jesus Christ. She had been driven into the kingdom by fear, as those about whom the Bible says are to be snatched out of the very fire. She was driven by fear, but when she entered the kingdom, she found a kingdom of love. And thereafter, in her ministry, was always to use the motive of love to draw people rather than that which had brought her. I'm afraid, however, in these days, when so many people believe that the higher critics have destroyed heaven and evaporated hell, it might be well for some to contemplate those words that drove Mary Slessor into the kingdom of God. There is, my friend, eternal punishment, or Jesus Christ is branded a liar. Having come to Christ, she immediately began to grow in grace with a tremendous dynamism. She took as a motto for her life the words of Jesus when he said, Learn of me. And those three words became the motto of all of the rest of her life. Learn of me. And she set herself out to do just precisely that, to learn about Jesus Christ and to become ever more like him. She had a vast reserve of love for Christ. She had indeed fallen deeply in love with Jesus Christ. And she had a spiritual radiancy that captivated people, drew them to her. And as she learned of Christ, she was to learn three great lessons that were to influence her life. The first thing that she learned about Jesus Christ is that he was the only Son of God, and that the God who had one Son made him a missionary, and that he had a great compassion and concern for the souls of men. And Mary caught some of that compassion of her Master, and she began to be concerned for those all around her in the city of Dundee. She began to be concerned for the eternal souls of the young ladies that dwelt in the slums of that city. She asked her pastor at the little church that she attended if he would give her a Sunday school class. At first, he refused because he said the children were unruly, but she insisted. Though she was diminutive of stature, she was determined in heart. And so she was given a class of what she described as lovable lassies that she would teach. And she said, I had at that time the impudence of ignorance to a very high degree. But in spite of her limited knowledge, she began to teach these young ladies as best she could. But there were a group of boys, ruffians, that would gather at the door and try to break up the class, and she had to deal with them as well. So one day, she went out to talk to them, and she was to learn another lesson from Christ, the lesson of courage, not only compassion and concern for the souls of men, but the courage that was necessary if one was indeed going to reach those people for Christ. And she talked to the young men, but they only mocked and taunted her. And finally, one of the larger boys pulled out of his pocket a heavy weight attached to a string. And he began to whirl it around his head, coming ever closer to Mary's face. But she stood her ground, stared him in the face with a faint smile on her countenance. Finally, as everyone stood breathless around watching this adventure, as Mary refused to move until finally the weight was whirling a fraction of inch away from her face, and then it hit her forehead and opened a gash, but still she didn't move. With that, the boy dropped the weight and started to run and said, Come on, fellas, she's game. We can't frighten her. Just as many others later were to learn 
that the courage she had learned from Christ was something that could carry her through far more terrific experiences than that. She learned compassion and she learned courage. And thirdly, she learned the importance of confidence in prayer. She learned that she could trust in God for all things. And this was a lesson that was to carry her well through the coming years of her ministry. She had grown now to be a young lady. Still, for 14 long years, she worked 12 hours a day in the weaving mill. And then the word came early in 1874. The word came of an event that had happened some months before, an event that electrified all of the world. Livingston is dead, and that world-famous missionary and explorer had breathed his last while in the position of prayer on his knees in the heart of Africa. And there was a great wave of enthusiasm for missions. And then the thought entered Mary's mind, why don't I become a missionary? And so, several years later, she sailed out of the brisk, cool air of Scotland down into the tropical air of equatorial Africa and finally landed on the west coast of Africa, at the mouth of the Calabar River, where several stations had been set up along the coast. And her lifetime dream had come true. Mary Slessor had gone. To Calabar. She was enchanted with what she saw, the beautiful lush tropics, the blue skies, the very colored birds, and all of the amazing things. But of course, just a few hundred yards inside, they were all of the terrors of the jungle, which she was later to know so well. She first began her ministry there in the mission stations, and she learned about Africa and what it meant to live and minister there. She learned the language of the people with great fluency. And though she had a great ministry there, she was not contented. But she knew that there was a region inland in a triangular part divided, separated by three rivers, where there was the people of the Okoyong, people where no missionary had gone before. And after much pleading, she was given permission to go as a pioneer solo missionary. And so she entered into this dreaded area of the country and began to proclaim the gospel with incredible results. And so that this whole area was changed by the preaching of the word. And still, she was not satisfied because she learned that beyond Okoyong, Deeper into the heart of Africa, there was an area where there were four million savages that were so ferocious, so fierce, that even the government parties of soldiers feared to penetrate into the land. There were four million cannibals whose lives were so degraded, whose customs were so vile, that it stretches the imagination of one to consider the types of things that they did. They worshipped fetishes, they murdered twins, they turned the mother of twins out into the jungle to be devoured by beasts because they believed that twins were brought about by a conjunction with a demon. Almost half of the population was slave. When a man died, his slaves were killed. When a chief would die, they would eat 50 slaves. 25 more would have their hands tied behind them and their heads would be whacked off. Unmarried women were chattel. They could be raped, tortured, murdered at will. It was an incredible degradation, especially of women. Children were considered as no better than animals, often simply left to die. Why do you bother with them? 
but Mary's heart was touched by the plight of twins who were always left to die or ground to pieces in a pot. And she would snatch them up and take them. At first they were astonished because they believed that anybody that touched a twin would die. But Mary didn't die. And so she gathered around her over the years many of these young bairns, as she called her children, to nurture them. Finally, she decided that she was going to penetrate this area where groups of armed soldiers refused to go. Mary Slessor went alone. Well, not really alone. She had six children with her. One, just an infant, that she had to carry in her arms because there was no place to leave them. They would be killed if she left them behind. And so she penetrated down the river, finally landed their canoe and began to walk up the trail that led into the very heart of cannibal land where juju worship was practiced, a demon in a tree. And there was a long path that led to the central village and to a lake and across a bridge to an island in the middle of the lake where there was a shrine to the juju god. And as people passed to make their ceremonies at the shrine, thousands would be captured every year and thrown into slavery and dealt with in the most debased sort of fashion. And along this pathway, there came curly-headed, blue-eyed Mary Slessor, the bonnie lass of Scotland. In incredible ways, by her faith in God and her prayer, her winning countenance, her incredible love that she demonstrated, she was accepted. People milled around her and looked. They had never seen a white person before. They touched her skin. And she began to teach them about the Son of God who had loved them enough to die for their sins. And astonishingly, God opened their hearts and they became very willing to hear. And one after another, the heads of the various villages yielded his life to Christ. And one after another, the tremendous horrible customs that had plagued these people for years was abolished. The murder of twins, infanticide, the slaughter of wives and slaves, the trial by poison and boiling oil and all of these terrible customs one by one were banished. They had been at perpetual warfare in the different tribes for innumerable centuries. But when she would hear of a tribe of warriors going out to attack another tribe, she would run barefooted through the jungle where there were poisonous snakes and poison plants, and she would cut them off. And she would stand in front of a whole host of armed cannibals with outstretched arms and demand that they stop. And they did because she prayed and she had trusted God. She believed that by his power she could do all things. Finally, as Christ wrought these supernatural works transforming this whole area until finally there came to the place that the Mary Slessor Mission Hospital was built right there in Cannibal Land. And a school and home for girls and wives was built. And many other institutions. As Mary Slessor, by the grace of God, transformed that whole region for Jesus Christ. But in time she grew old. Finally, her health failed her completely. And at 3.30, one dark morning, in the heat of an African night, she breathed her last. And the word went out all over Calabar and the various regions of Africa. Everybody's mother is dead. In all of Equatorial Africa grieved and mourned. And the word went out across Europe and back to England and Scotland. What was the secret of her life? She had learned of Christ. She had learned of his compassion, his concern for souls. She had learned his courage. And she had learned his steadfast faith 
in prayer. And when she died, the cry went out, Everybody's mother is dead, and people mourn for days. Because she had learned of Christ. Dear friend, may we hear the word of Jesus speaking to us today. Learn of me. May we pray. O oh Lord, help us to learn of thee. We thank thee, O oh God, that though thou hadst one son, he was a missionary. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps God is calling you to the mission field today. If so, don't ignore him. For others of us, we can share our faith with those around us, our neighbors, friends, family, even strangers that we meet. And winning our neighbor to Christ can have a profound impact on our nation and the world, just like in Mary Slessor's day. If you're watching this program today and you don't know the Christ whom Mary Slessor loved and served, you can. Simply pray this prayer with me right now saying, Lord Jesus Christ, forgive me of my sins and cleanse me and make me brand new so that I may live for you from this day forward. I place my trust in you and thank you for paying for my sins with your death on the cross and purchasing the free gift of eternal life for me. In your name I pray. Amen. I hope you just prayed that prayer just now. And if you did, we have a special gift that we'd like to send you. It's Beginning Again, written by Dr. Kennedy. And it will help you grow in your newfound faith. You'll learn how to read and study the Bible, which is essential for every Christian's life. You'll learn how to pray. And very importantly, you'll learn how to share your faith with others. To receive Beginning Again, just write to our address or call our toll-free number. God bless you as you do. I hope you've been inspired today by the story of Mary Slessor of Calabar. These character sketches were among the most popular messages Dr. D. James Kennedy ever preached for obvious reasons. If you would like to have a copy of this program to keep in your own resource library or to share with others, including your pastor, Bible study, or Sunday school class, we'd be happy to send you one as our thanks for your generous donation of any amount to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11164, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 888-332-3069, or go online to djkm.org. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us on this edition of Kennedy Classics. We'll see you next time. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.